Hi, this is Ron Sipsick, and this is part three in a three-part series on the complex circular flow model. <clears throat> in this particular segment, we're going to introduce the foreign sector into the model. And this will internationalize or make open the macro economy. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll use, uh, we'll use a different color here. You'll notice that in setting up the, the model, I'm using some abbreviations here. So let's just quickly review these so we're, we're familiar with what these symbols mean. Income, the blue line here flows into households. Households save. This is called net saving. That those funds flow through the credit market, and businesses do some borrowing. So you've got business borrowing here. And those funds flow into the business sector. Businesses save. So you've got your depreciation allowance flow and your retained earning flow coming into the investment flow. IA is actual investment. So this is I sub A. And uh, that, that's the first layer. The first layer is the blue layer we laid in. C stands for consumption. Okay. Then in the second segment, we introduce government. We said government basically does two things with money. It purchases things, so we call this G, and uh, also engages in transfers, government transfers. We call this GT. And then the money comes from three sources, personal taxes, business taxes, and then net government borrowing. So that's where we left off in our last segment. What we want to introduce today is the foreign sector. We'll put the foreign sector, change my color here, we'll put the foreign sector up here. And of course, the foreign sector would be every other economy in the world. So it'd be everything external to this system. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that when households spend, part of their consumption is domestic and part of their consumption is foreign. For instance, if I buy an automobile, part of the automobile, a new automobile, an automobile that was produced in this period, some of the parts in that automobile will have been made domestically, but some of the parts in that automobile will be imported. Very few automobiles in the world today um, can make the claim that they're made in one country. There's really no such thing as a domestic automobile today. So if you think about this, any, any spending really on pretty much any output, almost any output, has some foreign component to it. So C really breaks up into two parts, CD, which is consumption of domestic output. And of course, that's going to stay in the circular flow. And CF, CF, and I'll just have it stretch out here like this, CF, which would be that part of consumption which goes into the foreign sector because it's paying for it, something imported. I mean, even think about an, a McDonald's hamburger. You, you, you'd say, well, a McDonald's am, hamburger is all domestic. And my response to that is, well, no, it, no, it's not. Uh, the, the hamburger, the meat in the hamburger, may have been from Brazil. Uh, it is not out of the question that McDonald's could buy beef that was raised in Brazil, slaughtered in Brazil, the meat was packed and frozen in Brazil, and then shipped here for McDonald's. That's not out of the question. The paper in the wrapper, the McDonald's wrapper, may have come from Canada. And I could go on and on and on. The, the metal that's in a particular piece of equipment in McDonald's may have come from a foreign producer of metal. Maybe it's Russian steel. So the point is, you, you can't say that any one product is purely domestic and another product is purely foreign. It's very difficult to do today because the U.S. economy is very, very integrated. So consumption then really breaks up into two pieces. Consumption breaks up into CD, consumption of domestic output, and CF, consumption of foreign output. All right, and I'm going to stretch that that CF arrow all the way across because that's going into the foreign sector. Likewise, when the government buys something, some of the, some of the output it purchases is domestic. So C sub D, or G, G sub D, excuse me. But some of the output government buys may, <clears throat> excuse me, may be foreign. 
So governments like to buy paper. The paper that you, you oh, let me back up, you want to believe that the government, when it buys paper, that it tries to buy the cheapest paper possible. Well, perhaps the cheapest source of paper is Canadian paper. That's possible. Now, there are U.S. producers of paper, but the government is probably putting out bids and wants to get paper from the cheapest source if it's looking out for taxpayer interest. Well, that paper could come from Canada. So some government spending could be domestic. It could be on domestic output, but some government spending could be on foreign output. That's not out of the question. And so again, G breaks into GD, that's a G sub D, and G sub F, foreign. Likewise, I, I can be partly domestic, but I, investment, could be foreign. So a company can buy a truck, part of that truck was made domestically, but part of that truck is imported. And on and on we can go here. So I'm going to put in an IF here. Now, if you add together... CF, GF, and IF, you get M. M is imports, imports of goods and services. Now let me let me explain this. Because you're going, the arrow is going out. How can it be imports? Remember, the circular flow is tracking the flow of money, not the flow of goods and services. So when we import goods and services, the goods and services come in, but the money goes out. So when U.S. households buy something foreign, the goods come in, not shown, the money goes out, shown. When the government buys something foreign, imports something foreign, the goods come in, the money flows out, and so on. So the import flow is actually an outflow and that's very important for you to realize students confuse this all the time it bothers them but again the importation of goods and services mean the goods and services come in the money goes out and then turn it around foreigners will buy buy goods and services from this particular economy say this is the US economy well Exports of goods and services, let's think about this. When U.S. businesses, here they are over here, export goods and services to the foreign sector, the goods and services go out, but the money flows in. So exports of goods and services, I'll use an X here, exports of goods and services are an inflow. Now, the term would suggest it's an outflow, but remember the goods and services are going out, the money is flowing in. Okay? So there, we've now added two major international flows, imports of goods and services, exports of goods and services. You can see how they connect with the complex circular flow model. Now, that's not where the story ends. Okay, the story doesn't end here. Do foreigners save into foreign economies. Yes. So let's say that this is the U.S. economy. Can a foreign citizen save into this system? The answer is yes. So say this is Japan out here. This is the foreign sector. Can a Japanese citizen bring funds into the United States and save those funds in a U.S. commercial bank? The answer is yes. Could a Japanese citizen out here who isn't happy with retirement returns work through a broker and get those funds moved into the US stock market that may be perform a, a market that may be, per be performing better than the Japanese stock market perhaps so the point is funds flow from the foreign sector into the credit market this is this is really a saving flow likewise funds can flow out from a domestic economy into the foreign sector in other words, let's say this is America. Americans can save abroad. So there's nothing saying that Americans won't want to put funds into European stock markets or won't want to occasionally move funds into foreign banks where they can earn a better return. And there's other reasons why you might want to put funds into a foreign bank. It may not have anything to do with return. It may be that you're doing business in that country and you need to open up accounts in that country and have funds in those accounts to carry out your business transactions. All right, so the point is, the point is that 
there are savings flow, saving flows between countries, and we want to acknowledge those. Now, I don't have a lot of room here to, to do this, but let's just, the inflow, we're going to call a financial, F-I-N apostrophe S, inflow. That's an inflow. The outflow here we'll call a financial, financial outflow. So the, the, the line that's going out, the arrow that's going out is your financial outflow. The line that's coming in is your financial inflow. Okay, so these will turn out to be your top four international transactions. Um, your import flow is an outflow. Your import flow is an outflow. Your export flow is an inflow. Your financial inflow is an inflow. And your financial outflow is an outflow. Now, of course, these, these flows break down into many subcategories. And when you look at what is called a balance of payments table, you can, uh, you can just imagine that it's much more complicated than this, and it is. But if you want to get a general idea of how one economy connects to the world, the complex circular flow is very, very helpful in that respect. Now, let me just introduce you to something that is coming in a future lesson. I'm just going to give you a quick little, uh, a quick little short course on what we call balance of payments. So let me do that. I'm going to move this up and... Um, We'll, we'll just do something very, very quickly here. All right. I want to introduce you to the concept of a balance of payments table. Let me get my writing tool back in place here. So what is a balance of payments table? Well, first of all, this is a measure, as all the flows are, it's a measure of annual flows. What is it? It's a measure of the international flows between a given nation and the world. So maybe we do a balance of payments table for the United States. What we're going to be interested in is accounting for all of the transactions that the United States has done with other countries. Now you can imagine this is extremely difficult to measure. And we're at best just making crude estimates of actual trade flows and actual financial flows. Our measurement systems are not so perfected that we catch every dollar er that is flowing in and out. Okay? So <clears throat> these, like all government data, balance of payments data, these are estimates. But uh, they're good estimates, and they're estimates we do consistently. So even though we're mis mismeasuring uh, at all times, everything we're measuring macroeconomically is a mismeasurement. We're missing something. But if we measure the same way consistently and our methods stay consistent and we they're sound, they're sound statistically and they're consistent, you can actually look at trends. You can actually look at data over time and tell that something is changing. Okay? So let's go ahead and set up what we call uh, a balance what I call a balance of payments table and actually what's called a balance of payments table. Now again I am going to paint with a very, very, very broad brush here. I'm going to keep this very, very simple, and I'm going to simply use what we talked about, what we talked about up above. So, okay, so the column on the, the left will be inflows, the column on the right will be outflows. We have four basic international transactions, four basic international transactions. Now, those four flows should basically fit within this table, and guess what? They should balance. The, the, the ideal behind a balance of payments table is that the international flows balance. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. Let's go through these. One of our international flows is exports of goods and services. We said that's a what? That's a inflow. That's an inflow. And if you look at the complex circular flow model, you'll see it as an inflow. Imports, imports 
of goods and services are a what? They are an outflow. Okay, goods and services flow in, money flows out. Okay, it looks like I skipped, skipped one of our categories, unfortunately. So let me divide this line in half. Here we go. We also have a category called financial inflows. This would be where a foreign foreigner is saving into the domestic system. That's an inflow. And we could have a financial outflow. That would be where a domestic citizen is saving abroad. Now, when you add the in, now again, each of these categories would be broken down into many, 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 many subcategories. If you look at an actual balance of payments table, it looks very, very complicated because there are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands, let's say millions of people involved in gathering data like this. The government spends billions upon billions upon billions of dollars gathering economic da data to come up with tables like this. Okay, data generation, economic data generation in the United States is an enormous industry. It's huge, huge industry. So the level of detail is going to be very high in these types of accounts. And if you look at an actual balance of payments table for the United States, it's a fairly complicated looking document. However, if you look at the headers, you're going to see these four basic headers. Okay, you're going to see that, the, that everything basically breaks down into four types of flows. You add up all the inflows, add up all the outflows, you should get a number here that equals the number here. Now, let me tell you, they never equal because there's all sorts of measurement problems. There's it's, it, the difference is called a statistical discrepancy but these are measurement issues. Certain types of transactions are very, very, very difficult to measure. But the point is, in theory, a country's inflows, inflows should equal its outflows. Now I hasten to add, I'm gonna actually talk about this in a future video, that that doesn't mean we balance in trade. For instance, if we're, if we're imbalanced in trade, imbalanced in trade, we're going to be imbalanced down here for this to add up. So what you're going to see later on is that a country that's running a trade deficit where its imports are greater than its exports, it will be running a financial account surplus. Where a country is running a trade surplus, it'll be running a financial account deficit because in the end this has to balance. So I'm not saying that particular categories balance. What I'm saying is, is the overall balance of payments table balances. Now you're just going to have to wait until our next segment to learn more about this, but stay tuned. That's what we'll be talking about next time. Good night.